You're watching Behind the Headlines. I'm Lee Pacquia. Next week, the United States Supreme Court will hear oral arguments in two gay marriage cases, which promise to be among the most politically charged rulings of the term when they are handed down in late June. For a viewer's guide to the oral arguments, we're joined today by Tom Goldstein of Washington, D.C.'s Goldstein and Russell. He's one of the leading members of the Supreme Court Bar, and he's, of course, found it, the founder of SCOTUS Blog, of which Bloomberg Law is a sponsor. Tom, welcome back to the program. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So, Tom, both supporters and opponents of uh, same-sex marriage are watching these cases very closely, but it is possible that the justices will find a way to avoid the core issue of legalizing gay marriage, making these cases somewhat anticlimactic. It's definitely a possibility if the court can't come to a majority, they have off-ramps. So that the Proposition 8 case asks the court to decide a really fundamental question about whether there's a right to gay marriage. The Defensive Marriage Act case the next day challenges the constitutionality of a federal law that says federal benefits only go to heterosexual marriages. But the justices in either case could decide, we don't have the power to decide those issues. They could say, that the parties in front of them are the wrong ones, and they have, in fact, directed the litigants in the case to brief that question for them. So it's clear they have their finger on the trigger of deciding either the big question or deciding they actually don't want to have anything to do with it. Mm. Now, of course, during last year's Obamacare arguments, all eyes were on Justice Kennedy as he was the potential swing vote, although it didn't quite turn out that way. Will he be the focus of attention this time around? Yeah, I agree with you. I think he will. Justice Kennedy in the ideological center of this Supreme Court, particularly on this issue. Unlike with health care, where you're talking about Congress's powers, where the Supreme Court can be a little bit more jumbled up, on gay marriage, Justice Kennedy really has been the pivot for some time now. He's been actually a leading advocate for recognizing uh, claims of discrimination by homosexuals. And so if the plaintiffs in these cases who are trying to invalidate these restrictions on gay marriage and the rights of those of homosexual couples who are married, if they can persuade Justice Kennedy, then they've probably won their case because it's very unlikely that he would go with them, yet one of the court's four more liberal members would abandon them. So that's the key to getting to five votes. Of the justices usually considered to be on the left of the political spectrum, Ginsburg, Breyer, Kagan, and uh, Justice Sotomayor, who will you be watching most closely? Well, it's a really interesting question. I think you'd want to keep your eye on Justice Kagan, not because her vote is any more important. It obviously isn't. Each of the members of the court only gets one vote. But she's the tactically savviest. And so if you're talking about the oral argument, you really want to listen to the direction that she pushes the plaintiffs in the cases, because that's the path that she thinks could lead to victory. And she's just incredibly knowledgeable about how to get to five votes in the Supreme Court. Mm. Now, I have Justice Thomas, Roberts, Scalia, and Alito. Who's going to get your uh, most attention on the other side of the spectrum? I would say the Chief Justice from the right. After Justice Kennedy, he's probably the most likely vote for the plaintiffs in these cases to recognize some form of right related to same-sex marriage. I would say he's less likely than Justice Kennedy, but if the Chief Justice indicates he's with the plaintiffs, that's a really good sign for them. But he's very difficult to read. He's incredibly savvy about asking questions of both sides. So it's really often the case that we come out of an oral argument, we just don't know where he's at. Mm -hmm. Now, on Tuesday, uh, they'll be hearing the, uh, the case involving California's Proposition 8. What are you gonna, going to be looking for on uh, Tuesday afternoon? Well, Proposition 8 presents a really the more basic, more fundamental, and the more historic questions in the cases, I would say. The plaintiffs there, led by Ted Olson, a very famous conservative lawyer, and David Boies, have argued that the Supreme Court should hold that every state has to recognize same-sex marriage, but there are narrower ways of deciding the case. Maybe they could say that just California violated the Constitution by recognizing a right to same-sex marriage, then taking it away. Maybe they could say that eight states have violated the Constitution by granting civil unions but not allowing same-sex uh, couples to say that they are married. And so one thing I'll be watching for most on, in that argument on Tuesday is how broadly or how narrowly are the justices looking at the question in front of them. Mm. And of course, Wednesday is all about the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. What issue might that turn on? Well, that could be a question of states' rights. Clearly, the defenders of the law are pitching to Justice Kennedy that you have to allow the federal government to be able to 
make its own decisions, but the plaintiffs in the case say that the federal government needs to follow state definitions of marriage, so that'll be really important. Mostly what I'll probably be wondering about Wednesday is whether I see any clues on Tuesday. The cases are so closely related. It's not the same legal issue, but you're kind of sense as a justice of whether there are rights related to same-sex marriage probably carries over to both. Yeah, I was wondering if you could flesh that out for us a bit. Will we be able to really tell anything meaningful about Wednesday's DOMA case from Tuesday's Prop 8 arguments, or are they completely different matters? They're not completely different matters. The challenges are different and the statutes are different, but there's one core issue that's common between the two of them, and that is what kind of scrutiny do we apply to laws that either discriminate against homosexuals or particularly limit same-sex marriage? Do we give the government a very wide berth in the law that's known as rational basis review? Do we make the government really justify those laws with a really strong reason that's called heightened <coughs> scrutiny? And if a justice on Tuesday thinks that those laws need to be subject to heightened scrutiny, then they're going to think the same thing on Wednesday. Mm. Now, Tom, you were one of the few observers to correctly call how the court would rule in the o Obamacare cases. If you had to hazard a guess on the DOMA and Prop 8 cases today, how would you say the justices, justices will ultimately come down? I think it's an incredibly difficult call. The country has clearly moved incredibly quickly in favor of recognizing that there should be equal treatment for same-sex and opposite-sex marriages. But the issue is that the Supreme Court moves much more slowly than the rest of the country. And it's conservative both in its ideology but also in its disposition. It doesn't like to move too fast. So uh, to be honest, I think these cases are too close to call. All right. Tom Goldstein, thanks so much for your time today, sir. Thanks so much for having me. And as a reminder, we'll be live blogging the oral arguments next week on Bloomberg.com. Of course, as always, if you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues with Justice Gust, be sure to go check out our offerings on BloombergLaw.com and also on the Bloomberg Terminal. You can see more of our videos on YouTube and you can follow our updates on Twitter. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.